Hello everyone, it's Daria Tiesler and time for Impact Wellness Podcast. How a busy professional woman can adapt her nutrition to optimize her body and health results for life, forever. I'm talking here about longevity of her results. I have asked this question Owen Lazy, who is co-founder and director of Irish Strength Institute. He also works with professional professional people, nutritionists, coaches, functional medicine practitioners, and supports their journey with knowledge so they can optimize how they see the body and how they can bring their customers, male and female, further results on optimization of health. Welcome, Owen, and thank you so much for joining Impact Wellness Podcast. Pleasure to be here. Hopefully, I can share some information for your listeners and get them used to understanding the strange, thick Irish accent. I believe uh, we'll be fine. I'm Polish, so my accent may be confusing as well. So don't worry, we get there. Um, I remember uh, when I spoken with my uh, my colleague Magda, she always used to uh, talk a lot about you so many positive words and uh, always being uh, very positive the way you are um, passing the information, the way you are sharing, the way you are coaching and educating. Uh, that's why I felt uh, it's going to be amazing to have you on this podcast because we need people as yourself who knows how to touch the heart of our general population. So that was my little uh, intro, so everyone knows why I actually uh, brought uh, Owen here. Owen, uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, professional journey, so public knows who you are, what you do, and how you end up being where you are today. Okay, so um, how I started out in this industry, I initially wanted to be a trainer in the army, um, but at, at a young age, leaving school, I didn't want to commit to so many years in the army. So I decided not to go down that route, to go down into fitness and health. So I went to college to study fitness and leisure management, and I was pretty young. So I got a, my first gym and a job at 16. Um, so I've been working in the gym since I was 16. And then I, I progressed on from one club to the next. Running in Ireland, we had two really big gyms. Actually, they were, they were the biggest gyms in Europe at the time. And so I, I worked there for a long time. I actually was one of the, the managers in the biggest gym here in Ireland. And I seen that health and fitness and well-being was more treated like a cash cow. It was more like a membership. It was more like, all about money. It wasn't necessarily about the, the health journey. It wasn't about the goal of the clients or, or, the, or the members. It was more about having the prestige of having a membership on your key ring, but not necessarily going. So that led me off to study. I went back to college to study physical therapy. Then I felt that I needed, I, did, I think rehab has a limitation. I felt nutrition was my weak link. And then I got into nutrition and I just have never looked back. So I've, I've studied functional medicine, nutritional medicine, nutritional environmental medicine. I've, I've studied endocrinology. I'm a phlebotomist. I, I'm here in my clinic now at the moment. So for me, I have a saying, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. And I, I own a number of gyms here in Ireland. We've got a gym over in Portugal, but it's not about going to a gym. It, it really isn't. You could have, get the same health benefit from, from walking or from running, if, depending on your goal, if you're an athlete, I don't believe that's true, but from the health side of things, nutrition, sleep, mindfulness, meditation, connection with family and friends, I think everyone has to well, should be embracing different components of health to, to you know to harmonize their body to move better. It's not all about not eating food, counting calories, and getting sweaty in the gym. So for me, I feel big gyms they do serve a purpose. Don't get me wrong, but I think there's a big gap missing in the market. That's attention to detail. That's listening to a client. That's helping someone. And we can sit here and we can talk about methylation and genetic polymorphisms and you know good health. And people go, what is he talking about? I want the listeners to lead today. Going, I understood that. I can do that. That'll help me. So simple things, as my friend says, simple things done savagely well. If you have the best supplement in the world, but your sleep is terrible, it will not work. If you've got the best program in the world, 
which are dehydrated, it will not work. If you got low, low testosterone and you want to bring up your testosterone, if you have blood sugar imbalance, no matter what you do, it will be hampered. So sometimes I think a little bit of education is good. And I think in today's society, health and fitness and well-being, having big biceps might be something that's far to. That's not health. That's not real health, you know. Filling your shirt or bench pressing, whatever, or squatting. For some people, that could be an aspirational goal, and I think that's commended. But health isn't restricted to, to weight training, isn't restricted to yoga, isn't restricted to hiking. It's what suits that person in their position and in their whatever their journey is in life. So hopefully that's what I'll share with your listeners today. I'm so glad you are touching um, so many points because uh, listeners can understand that we are uh, going beyond um, just being at the gym, building big biceps, having six pack for a woman who is uh, very busy and uh, has very busy career and is busy mother. And that's what we're going to actually discuss. So our podcast is more going into a case study and that you touch also so many points in regards to sleep, supplementation, um, healthy nutrition, uh, all the processes of, uh, you know, detoxification, how body works together. This is all very important. But as you said, you know, you can take the best supplements or have the best training program. If the basics are not there, this is just not going to uh, work. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have in case, case study here, busy women, um, mother, CEO, professional, uh, you know, busy owner. And she comes and she would like to understand how she can support her body composition uh, goals, what she should do. We can talk generally, whatever, whichever way you wish to go, how she should adapt health, lifestyle, nutrition, sleep to what actually she is having in front of her. Okay, so I have a little analogy that I use and hopefully this will translate to your listeners. So imagine we're all in a car. We're all in, in my car outside and we're going to go on a journey. A lot of times people feel that in the car, exercise should be the driver. No, no, I'm the boss, I'm going to drive. Exercise, if you train five times a week, five times a week only represents 2.9% of the week. Let me say that again. If you train five times a week, it only represents 2.9% of the total week. So exercise, a lot of times, is put in the driving seat, where nutrition, I think, sometimes should be in the driving seat. Or if you look in the back of the seat, we have lifestyle. We have maybe some medical condition, and maybe we have, like I always say, like special considerations. I have so many women that have come to me that have underactive thyroid, that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, that have endometriosis, that have hormonal imbalance. I have one lady in here and she says, oh, I'm coming to see you, not because I believe in you, but someone told me you could help me go to the bathroom. I spend 200 euro every month on colonics. I'm like, why? I don't go to the bathroom. That's not okay. So for me, before you embark on a journey, first, and again, any sat now, any sat now in the world, you need two things. One, your current location, and two, your destination. We need these two locations. Who's going to drive the car through different legs of the journey will depend on the client. And to give your, your people an, an, an answer, the people that should drive first are the people that need to give the car attention. If your car has no petrol, well, then I wouldn't be going anywhere. If there was no air in the tires, we would need to do that. So for me, when a client comes with a body composition goal, I ask them, well, how long have you put this weight on for? And how much weight are you looking to lose? For me, weight loss is a very, I don't want to say superficial, because that's not what I mean. I think for me, on the hierarchy of importance, it's lower. But for a client, it could be higher. I would ask the client, I, I use my pen, and say, if this was a magic wand, What's your magic one questions? And I love the answer. Answer number one, I want to lose weight. Answer number two, I want to have more energy. Answer number three, I want my brain to go back to weight working again. And number four, I want to be happier. I'm like, oh, why on earth is fat loss number one on that list? But that's something to say. I'm not here to tell clients what they want. I'm here to help facilitate them. So for me, a lot of times when people come and the goal is body composition, or what, what I try to do is exercise is so important. So what I put in is, is some form of exercise that is not going to kill them. It could be corrective work, it could be mobility work, it could be yoga. And in conjunction with that, I might take the exercise and put it in the passenger seat. 
So it's still important. And then take nutrition and put it in the driving seat. And maybe work on the first two or three weeks up a month. I'm not aggressive, but really big changes nutritionally with exercise. And when the nutrition is somewhat understand, understood, it's implemented, then I swap. Then I increase the exercise and I stabilize nutrition. And then maybe I might work on something in the background, get a lab test on, get an allergy test on, if, if I feel it's needed. But what both people do is imagine me and you in the car, and I'm exercise, and your nutrition, and you, no, you didn't sit on my lap, I sat on your lap, or whatever tried to happen, we couldn't drive the car. Who, who controls the pedals? Who's steering? So what a lot of people do is, that's it now. I'm getting in shape, I'm sick of feeling crappy, I'm gonna kill my nutrition and kill my training. And what happens to their hormones? They plummet, they're not sleeping, they're irritable, they're moody, their blood sugar is all over the place, the menstrual cycle, the digestion, it's too much too soon. We need to do things in the right order. Now, there's not always the correct order, but not all of the one time. You know, like it's not baby steps, it's progression. We're moving forward because if you start off on that journey, and you go hell for leather, at some point, we're gonna be on the side of the road, smoke coming out of the engine, and then we're all devastated that we didn't stick to the plan. And people say, oh, motivation. Motivation for me is, there's a really good book, it's called The Myth of Motivation. Motivation is good to get you going. Motivation doesn't keep you going. Getting success, achieving, feeling better, seeing progress, learning how to adapt, we all know that we might take a wrong turn on our sat nav. We all do. But we have, because we know our destination and we know our, our, where we are now, we can reroute because we have that knowledge. And maybe it's a situation where I say, you know what? No, nutrition, you're driving now. No, lifestyle, because of the wedding coming up or a holiday coming up or stress and work, you're going to come up. Kids going, my kids went back to school today. So when kids go back to school, there's all this additional stress. But if you know that's going to come, if you know there's going to be challenges, but then we can slip and we can slide and we can divert and reroute. But for me, we need to identify that there will be challenges ahead. Skill your clients with the knowledge and the skills to be able to adapt it, that they don't end up falling off the wagon and then, and then not getting the results. So for me, it's about prioritizing nutrition, exercise, lifestyle in, in a systematic approach for that client. If someone had no kids, no, no job worries, no money worries, and they had people doing lots of stuff for them, like celebrities, go for it. But that's not the majority of people that I deal with. I deal with real people in the real world, with real kids, real stressful jobs, stressful relationships, and so on. So we need to support them rather than take away all the time. I, I so much agree with you, and uh, it's not the first once uh, you have. I have been working with uh, clients who comes and wants twelve weeks or six weeks or nine weeks body changes, and uh, reality is it's not possible. They was just after miscarriage. They used to follow low low fat diets for years. Uh, they don't sleep. The menstrual cycle is off, and let's say they suffer PCOS, and that's are the cases. So uh, it's so much. Um, there is so much awareness and I agree with you that needs to be brought into a uh, health and fitness industry and education of coaches uh, here. That is not uh, everyone's path to go and get six pack in 12 weeks. It's just possible in some way, but in some way it's not possible. And always is going to come with comprom compromise of health to some extent, right? What do you think? Just I go a little bit off about those um, 12 weeks changes on people who in theory should take a bit longer to get and achieve those goals just because health is not there this is this is an interesting topic some people are, are i'm not a big fan of fat diets however there is some research that came out in the uk where they gave people radical weight loss diets and when people see results they were more willing to stay with the program thereafter. So for me, transformations, six weeks, nine weeks, 12 week transformations, I can understand from a marketing point of view how they hook people in. I can understand that it's maybe good to generate people into the gym, but it's longevity. If me and you walked into any job, let's say we are accountants or, or architects or, or, or bankers, you're not gonna get to the top position in that job in nine weeks. 
you get what you, you put into your, your body, your education, your nutrition, your investment and time, and it takes a bit of time. However, I, t I honestly do think if someone has a goal in, in mind of 12 weeks, they can get in, in much better shape than they are now. But for me, it's about where they travel or how they continue to travel the 12 weeks after. So for me, an introductory 12-week transformation to rebuild your body and then give you the skills to move on is, 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 is essential. So I'm not a fan of them, but I think with a good coach and a good understanding, it can be a stepping stone for some people. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's nice a breakthrough from uh, something we don't like into something what we made like in three weeks time, uh, in 12 weeks time. But again, it's about how you build in awareness around those 12 weeks that this is not just beginning uh, end is going to be beginning for you. So you have yeah. to keep uh, continue the path. Um, on that topic, one thing came about, there's a really, really good book called The Presence by Amy Cuddy. And in it, she talks about priority. So, for example, if I said to you, no, I need you to have breakfast before you go to work. And you say to me, no, I haven't got time. I've got the kids to go. And then, and then I rephrase that. And I say, okay, well, maybe when you go to leave work, your front door doesn't close. It doesn't lock. Are you going to leave your front door open at your house? No. You'll make it a priority to get it fixed before you leave. So the fact is, people don't put their health as a priority until something happens. Not to be sexist, but two times I've seen people, well, three times I've seen people super focused when it comes to nutrition training as athletes, because they're signing big contracts at the end of the year, at the end of the season. People trying to become pregnant, male and female, trying to enhance fertility. They're super focused on doing anything you tell them. And females getting ready for a wedding. I've seen people that were never compliant with nutrition or exercise in their life. When a wedding comes up, oh my God, they'll do anything. So the, the fact is, we, we as coaches and trainers and, 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 and experts need to help clients realize that it is a priority now. Don't wait till your leg falls off. Don't wait till you've got diabetes. Don't wait till you're infertile. Don't wait till you've got brain fog. Don't wait till your skin is, is breaking out in a rash and you've got alopecia until you're born out. That's not the time to stop. The time to stop is when the light on the dashboard says, look at me, I'm not doing well. Pull over, service your car, and then continue on your journey. Don't wait till you crash before you address the big issue. And sometimes those transformations can speed that process up. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Owen, uh, you said uh, on this, uh, in this uh, kind of conversation uh, within this question um, about impact of female hormones, you mentioned PCOS, PCOS, there should be kind of endometriosis, probably we're talking about stress, busy life, increase uh, of the cortisol. Uh, I really would love to touch this because that's um, often come with increased um, body fat right and i don't think women join those two they think uh, i have to cut calories and go on low fat diets and then follow lots of uh, exercise and the fats will shift off and that's not always the case let's explain a little bit how stress impact female hormones what's happening what is the path in biochemistry here in a simple way Okay, so, so simply put, so male hormones, female hormones, all ex extremely, extremely similar. But the, the manifestation and, the, and the, the amounts are different, obviously. When it comes to females, so for example, if you stress a female out, or you stress a male out, the certain stress hormones will get released. For a man, if you stress me out, and this is the thing with stress, I could insult you, I could infect you, I could punch you in the arm, physical stress, emotional stress, financial stress, I could charge you 50,000 euro for this podcast and you feel under financial stress, but they're all stressors and the hormones don't know the difference. So if you stress a man out, my testosterone will go down, I will increase an enzyme in my body called aromatase and I'll make more estrogen. For a female, if I stress her out, I'll actually bring down her estrogen and bring up her testosterone. And, and these are things, we have a, a very set level of blood sugar that we need to have. And we have a, a, a hormone in our body called cortisol that's released by our, from our adrenal glands. And one of the primary jobs, among many jobs, that cortisol does is to help maintain blood sugar levels. Insulin brings blood sugar down, cortisol brings it back up again. And cortisol is released in conjunction with epinephrine and norepinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline to bring blood sugar back up again in that fight or flight response. But the fact is, we could be worried about something 
that hasn't actually happened. And this seesaw, and that's what it is, the seesaw or tsunami. We want our blood sugar like this. We do not want tsunamis. We do want big seesaws. And this the cortisol, although it is beneficial and essential, particularly in the morning, has a feedback to thyroid. And then our thyroid, if you want, is the brake and accelerator on every cell of our body. Stop, go, stop, go. And I, I, I know females, they have their menstrual cycle. Men, we have our own cycle. It's not like your cycle. We have a circadian cycle through the whole day of hormones in the morning, hormones at night time. And the more we are stressed, the more we're stressed from physical stress, dietary stress, mental stress, emotional stress, the more impact we're having on these hormones. And I have females come into me, like that's, that's why I have my clinic, because I have females come into me 40, 50, and they're eating nothing. They're training really hard and they're not losing weight. That, that is not an exercise problem. That's not a calories in, calories out problem. That's a hormonal, that's a metabolic issue. And just because I'm going to go off on a tangent now, and I apologize, but I feel very strongly about it. Females come to me and say, Owen, oh, I cannot lose weight. What am I doing wrong? And I say to them, well, how often do you, do you eat meat in the week? Red meat? Oh, I don't eat red meat. Oh, you don't eat red meat. Okay. I said, how heavy is your cycle? Oh, I have a very strong cycle. It's, it's five days. The flow is very strong. I'm like going, okay. So you don't eat red meat. So the chances of you being anemic are massive. You don't eat red meat, which is the biggest source of carnitine in the body. So when you burn fat, think of burning fat in a fire. We need, first of all, the logs, which is our fat. We, we all have enough of it to burn. But we need carnitine to transport fat in and oxygen. If you're anemic and you don't have carnitine, you, you can't efficiently burn fat. So these people are killing themselves. And you know what? They're so zapped. They're drained. And the first organ the body to feel like it's your brain, brain fog, energy. If I was to ask a female, I don't, in my opinion, if you, if you look at your mobile phone now, I'm sure it's above 70% or above 80%. You ask a female, what percentage is your battery in the morning? They'll say maybe 30%, 40%. In my opinion, that person should begin a weight loss journey until they're at least 80% because how long they can stay driving isn't long enough. Let them feel better. Let them be better in their own skin, their own headspace, their own mentality, their own environment. And then we, we can build things along, but not aggressively. Bring in like calorie counting to start off. I think is, it can be beneficial to be, make people aware of what they're eating. I think people need to be more aware of what they consume and how much they're eating and what times and so on, which we could talk a lot about. But I want to make sure that when it comes to hormones, what we're doing, what we're eating, what we're drinking, how we're living, and how we're training, how that is impacting our hormones. Females do not do well if they're hormonally imbalanced to intermittent fast. Intermittent fasting can be very beneficial for some people if they're already at 80 or 90% of energy. If they're not, it's just another stress. And I don't want to add more stress on your plate. I want to, if I can, I need to take some stress off your plate, but I understand I'm a realist, kids, marriage, partners, wives, husbands, friends. Sometimes you can't do that. But what I can do is I can make your battery 30% to 100%. And when it's at 100%, you can better manage. If you want to call it physical resilience, you can call it hormonal flexibility, you can call it metabolic flexibility. I don't really mind what team you put on it, but the more energetic you are, the more you can handle what's going to come your way. And hormonally, I think people go, ah, hormones don't matter. Sometimes they're not the biggest problem, but sometimes they are the biggest problem. Like I, I, I can show you bloods from hundreds of clients with hormonal issues, particularly thyroid. Thyroid and anemia, I think women don't, they, don't, they really ne neglect to fully investigate what's going on. And a lot of physicians say, you don't have a problem yet, but you will be able to arrange later down the line. I don't care about later down the line. I can't. I don't want to change what's going to happen in 15 years' time. I want to do it now so we don't get to that location in the first place. So hormonally, what I would say is the, probably the biggest way to, to help people with their hormones is, one, get a test done. Get a test to see what your hormones are. Number two, manage blood sugar, I think, is fundamental. I think it's under, under uh, overlooked. 
component, then look at sleep. And once we do blood tests, we control blood sugar, we look at sleep, then we can really start to say something isn't going on, it will, it will stick out a ugly head. I'm so glad you're touching um, anemia because that's what I see in my clinic as well. And uh, I practice as yourself um, functional medicine and when is needed and most of the time is needed. Uh, is looking at, uh, I look at uh, blood tests and outside of other uh, type of functional testing. But thank you so much for sharing this because I think most of women does not realize, obviously because health practitioners and there is nothing against them, we actually want mm -hmm. to support them here. They're looking for those um, normal range, but what is normal for me is not normal for you, but most of women will be in the bottom range. But the impact of um, anemia and iron deficiency or b12 deficiency on ability to support your thyroid is huge so that is uh, that is amazing what you uh, just uh, shared owen and i think as well the blood sugar regulation so and you touched another another thing and i wanted to ask you what do you think about intermediate fasting right or fasting because that's what I, I also see, oh, Daria, what do you say about this vaccine? Oh, this doctor talk about this. Oh, this someone talk about this. I said, yeah, but how does this work for you? You cannot wake up in the morning, your energy is down. How can you then keep going without food, right? And yeah. everyone is looking uh, into what is trendy, la rather looking what actually works uh, for me. So if women uh, would like to try fasting, yeah. And there is no way. I must trust. I might. Tr I must try this. What would be your advice? Okay. So you didn't I've convince me. You didn't convince me. I really want to try this because it's trendy. And you know okay. how how can I approach this topic? So this, this this is it. So simply put, from seeing so many nutrition, I see breakfast or lack thereof, a little bit of food, and then I see a massive dinner. If you want to, all the ladies out there, all the ladies, if you want to try intermittent fasting. The best approach is breakfast and lunch. All you do is bring your dinner early. If you want to try intermittent fasting, you get the best benefit from it. Bring your food up to the fourth part of the day. Having a bigger meal at night time and having all your amino acids or the majority of your amino acids and essential fatty acids coming at night time is not advantageous. For me, what I would do is I would have one, I'd have one to three meals in the start of the day. Within 60 minutes upon waking up, then maybe four or five hours later, and then a little bit after that, then ideally maybe finishing your last meal at three to four, depending on what you can manage. And having a bit of carbs that last meal, I would suggest for some people. But move your dinner earlier, and you will, you will wake up hungry, digestively prepared for food. Your, your, your whole hormonal system, and what that does is we have two classifications of clocks in our body. We have a central clock in, a, in, a, in our superclinomastic nucleus, then we have peripheral clocks in our muscles and in our, in our lungs and our liver, and it helps to recirculate them and reset them to the correct circadian system. So just move your dinner up. Just have an early dinner. You try that out. I can guarantee everybody on this podcast, listen to this, you, you will feel better. Hormonally, you'll feel more settled and more resilient. Digestion will feel better. But make sure you have like two or three meals in that window. Or just bring it up early and you will get benefits. Don't skip the breakfast. Skipping the breakfast for someone that's already metabolically flexible is okay. It's convenient. That's why people do it. It's convenient not to go to work. That doesn't mean you're not going to get paid. So you have certain things that require a challenge. And I feel not having breakfast is a form of intermittent fasting that's adopted first, but it's not as advantageous as an early dinner. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And that's what we see in our clinic. That's that's why it's so valid, everything that Owen uh, is sharing here. It's not just um, taken from scientific paper, did not put into clinical practice. And that sometimes mismatch um, itself. Um, uh, you talked about um, morning energy. And we know when morning uh, energy is down, that's kind of could be linked to lower also overproduction of cortisol depending of test yeah. uh, right what test will show but let's talk about overproduction of cortisol and its effect of over um, lack lack of production and its effect on the female uh, body composition because i think that is big topic that women that women do not grasp they yeah. always link fat uh, to uh, calories and training, they're not linking fat 
uh, to hormones and specifically to cortisol. And we're talking so much about this belly fat. Uh, kind of we could talk about different parts of the body as well if yeah. there is uh, because there is an impact on estrogen production as well yeah so what, what what happens is when it comes to the body fat deposition so the adrenal glands as we, as we mentioned earlier on release cortisol now according to, to the dutch test a, a, a large majority up to maybe 95 up to 97 percent of the cortisol released from the adrenal glands comes in the form of cortisone. Cortisone, I like to say to people, is imagine I use euro here in, in, in Ireland, so I get paid in euro, but I also get, I also make a certain amount of dollars. So in this analogy, cortisol is euro and cortisone is dollars. Now, if you want to change your money over, if you need more cortisol, your body's under more and more stress all the time, whether it be blood sugar stress or hormonal stress or sleep deprivation or lack of food or whatever it may be, is the body wants more cortisol. So what it does is it takes the cortisol and it can actually transfer it or, or metabolize it back to cortisol through fat tissue. And fat tissue is one of the tissues we call it the bure de chans. It can change the, the, the dollars into euro so you can use it so a lot of females and it's been shown they hold on to more fat tissue why because they want that ability to transfer it back over and where is that area particularly for men it's visceral adipose tissue we call it vat v-a-t visceral adipose tissue females don't have the same ability to store visceral adipose tissue than men you could see i could go down to the village now and i could see a lot of men in the village Big fat bellies, skinny arms, skinny legs, no bone. When a female puts on body fat, it tends to be a different deposition. It tends to be more on the back of the arm. It tends to be more on the bone and on the toy. It generally isn't a very big belly. It can be. People get bigger. But it's not the general deposition of body fat. And what we have there is, in the body fat world, we call it android body fat, which is an apple shape, and then we have a, a, a gynoid, which is a pear shape, more hips and bone. And that can be down to blood sugar dysregulation, cortisol requirement, and not that it's excessively produced, but the body is making areas to convert the secondary hormone back to it. But it's all a sign. And this is the thing, I, I'm, not to, I'm not trying to say people are fat, but when I see people with a higher fat deposition and higher body fat percentage, if you are overweight and have excessive body fat, you are inflamed. This is causing chronic, systemic inflammatory cascade in your body. Your C-reactive protein, your hemoglobin A1C, your blood sugar level, your thyroid. Your body doesn't need this additional body fat. And if we were to, if you want to look at any tissue in the body, so let's say you have a friend of mine, he's a really big bodybuilder, big guy, right? And he's like 130 kilos. He's much more muscular than me, much more muscular than me. But our livers are pretty much the same size. So our livers won't change differently. So you'll see guys that are very muscular, but fat tissue has an uncapped ceiling of growth. You can see people at 1,000 pounds putting on a gross amount of weight. Why? And Dr. Robert Roundtree, a faculty member of the Institute of Functional Medicine, has a great saying. He says, the solution to pollution is dilution. So when you're giving more excess calories and the body's like, well, where am I gonna put this? Will I put it in the liver? No. Will I put it in the heart? No. Where will I put it in the, in the brain? No. Or put it in fat tissue. Why? We wanna get that hot potato and put it away from where somewhere is gonna damage. If you put fat into your lung, that's not good. If you, put, you deposit fat into your liver, we've all heard of non-alcoholic fatty liver. You put fat inside a muscle, it's not good. It doesn't work well because that fat shouldn't be there. So our body is having unsealing level of hypertrophy or tissue growth of fat tissue. Why? They keep you alive. So if you're walking around with excess fat, your body's done that. They keep you alive. So yes, you can eat less of it, I, I strongly think that should be the fourth step. Two, you can burn some of it off, but you need to set the metabolism so we can do that. And a lot of people aren't metabolically, hormonally, or muscularly sensitive to do that. And that's, that goes to another question. When someone says to me, oh, I want to burn more fat, and they say, I'm going to go out running for 60 minutes or 90 minutes, I see these people run, like, oh my God, their knees, their back, their ankles. I'm like, oh Jesus, something's going to happen to their legs. 
So I'm a pretty mean coach. If you get me in the gym, I'll, I'll be mean to you. But I, I would, don't think I've ever given so many more than, I don't know, 500, 300 squats in a workout. That's a lot of squats in my opinion. But how many times do you run ankle, knee and hip when you go for a jog? And these people are overweight and joint alignment. So then you have the oxidative stress. When you do aerobic exercise, you have increased oxidative stress. Reactive oxygen species, more stress, more cortisol, seesaw, seesaw. So the modality of exercise should be more yoga, pilates, tai chi, saunas, flotation therapy, a little bit of biking, something that's, that's not gonna damage the body because realize, if I was to ask you, what was your first car you ever had? Do you remember? My first car? Yeah. Uh, Ford Focus. Or focus, okay. Yes, it's still a car of mine from the last 12 years. <laughs> I had a, a Volkswagen Golf, right? Now, are you still driving that car? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So, but to be honest, it's well looked after. <laughs> okay. that's, 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 that's my point. I got my car back in 1998. It was a 95 car, but in 1998 I got it. So, so I don't still have that car. But if I did, I would have to look after it, like you're looking after your car. So the more mileage your car builds up over time, the more distress you put, the more trips you go on, the more baggage, the more kids, the more friends, the more people have been in the car, the more wear and tear. We only have one body. So if your car has had more damage or more mileage on it, the last thing I'm gonna do is give it less petrol and then drive it into the ground outside doing Martin run. I'm not saying I'm not a fan of running or exercising that modality for the right pace at the right time, but it's an inefficient and highly damaging move exercise that can cause joint problems that are not necessarily strong and stable joint or muscularly supported. So for me, it just Oh, I just I, I could keep going, but I'll stop there for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just uh, would like to refresh and reframe for anyone who is joining our podcast now. We are talking about a busy, li- busy woman with busy lifestyle, professional. Either she is a mother, either she runs busy uh, business, and we are trying to tell her or maybe make her aware how in different way and we touch in functional me- functional medicine way um, to approach her body composition her health and that is a uh, very important approach your health first to then get your body results uh, beautiful <laughs> thank you so much Rowan. i think i need to change a car but that is the key as you mentioned our and i think my answer was uh, very spot on here because i look after and it's different way you can, and that's what we're trying to uh, push here. Look after your body when is needed, not when, uh, uh, you know, not when is needed, but when it's not too late. Never is too la- too late. But like I discussed the other the other day with Adrienne from um, uh, Stens and say, um, we did, we had the same topic. Is when you get in a, into menopause, and then is the crap what's going on suddenly i cannot do this i cannot do this my body aches i cannot sleep i'm gaining fat all around that is the reason we're recording this podcast to make you aware you look after your body when you're 20 when you're 30 when you're 40 because those times are very challenging so when you hit your menopause it's much easier for your body to handle those huge changes in um hormones and i know you had some questions about menopause as well on your instagram right you were answering some question about that so definitely join um uh, join uh, owen uh, instagram account okay we continue how fat is important a healthy quality fat uh, in female diet and we know that many women is cutting fats for fat loss uh, and probably that is the drive from past uh, ideas 10 20 30 years ago right low fat diets and how fat is important uh, into female diet what women should be aware of so, so first when it comes to, to fat intake the reason why fat intake has been demonized or looked down upon in, in, a, in a calorie intake is because of its calorie equation. So one gram of fat equals nine calories. So people feel that if they reduce fat, 
they can drop their calories down quite easy. Now, a good friend of mine, Dr. Serrano, what he says is there's no essential carbohydrate. There's essential fatty acids, there's essential amino acids, but there's no essential carbohydrate. And I would agree with him when it comes to that from a biochemistry point of view. What we need to realize is that when you, when, they, when the scientists worked out what a calorie is, they, they, they burn the food and it raised the temperature of, of water by one degree Celsius in a calorometer, and that's how they worked it out. We're not machines. We're all very different. A thousand calories of broccoli is different than a thousand calories of sugar. And they, they have different impacts in the body and at different stages of their life. So for me, I even have it here. I have my, my little graph here when it talks about all the calories and what cholesterol does for my clients. But the reason why I show them that is because cholesterol is essential for the production of our sex hormones, for estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, and so on, and DHEA. And what I try to get across to people is our, the, the cholesterol in your body right now, right now, at least 70, up to 80% of it, we made. We didn't eat it, we made it. So our body is making cholesterol. Now, I like to think of it like two um, Pac-Men, two, two cells talking to one another. And we have trillions of cells in our body. And when one cell talks to your cell, the goal is that we send something in, we ask it to do something, and then something might come out and so on. Depends where the cell is. But around every cell in our body is a phospholipid membrane. It's how things get in and outside the cell. The receptors, the transport, the channels. So every cell in our body needs fat around it. So when females go on a low fat diet, first thing that they are deficient in is vitamin A, D, E, and K. Now, vitamin E is essential for multiple things, oils, cell formation, antioxidants, vitamin D, we could be here all day, bone density, hormones, everything. Then we talk about vitamin A. Vitamin A is essential for thyroid function, for thyroid receptors, for skin health. So there's all of these things that people are not aware of that we get from fat. Then, if we're not getting fat in, in our body, hormones go all over the place. Brain production, cognition, focus, you know, being able to uh, turn over our new cells. In, in, in our body, we have what's called the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is the sanitation system of the body, transports fats and so on. We have, a, we have a process in our brain called the glymphatic system. And the glymphatic system is where our brain and neurons in our brain shrink. They're around 20 to 40 percent at night time and our body uses cerebral spinal fluid to give our brain a massage and get it ready for the next day, wash it out and so on and shampoo it. But we need fats. We need vitamin A, vitamin E, we need our essential fats, we need our, our hormones to do that. And if we're on a hormone deficient diet, nails, skin, hair, estrogen, they all get compromised. So I'm not saying that a calorie deficit diet is going to do that, but a calorie deficit diet that's focused on the reduction or the depletion of fats will cause that depletion down the line. So for me, I like to have all my females having some sort of fish oil, if that's open for them. I like nuts. I like to, to, to roast the nuts or soak the nuts or activate them as people call them. I'm not a big fan of nut butters. Peanuts are not nuts, by the way, just in case people start going down the peanut route. I like olive oil. I like fish, if people can handle it. Obviously, keep away from the, the tune and so on. And swordfish, heavy metal free uh, uh, avocados, good fish, good fish oil, good nuts, good seal, uh, uh, seeds, and olive oil are ideal. And uh, there is um, definitely truth that not necessary. Uh, why not necessary? If you eat fat, you will you will gain fat on the no. body tissue. Actually, is the other way around, right? It's, no, it's not always the way around. If, you, if your diet is too high in calories, it, it, yes. it, uh, any, any excess of anything is going to pull up weight. But the fact is, if by eating fat, it's much more absorbable. There's less, there's no insulin response from it. And what, what I would say about that is, in our body, we have um, a gallbladder. And a gallbladder stores boil and releases boil. This is the issue. When people don't have a function gallbladder, sometimes they increase the, the body's um, anti, we call it, detergent. Boil is like a detergent as well as a emulsifier of fat for a small intestine. So women that have SIBO or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or wind or gas or bloating or constipation, diarrhea, I would look at gallbladder function. We can look at that in a blood test and you can also get a, a, an ultrasound. But the fact is that we want to be able to make sure gallbladders are working. A lot of women have a gallbladder taking out 
And that gets taken out, they need to be supplementing with oil to, to help the emulsification of fats. So eating fat is very anti-inflammatory. Eating fat is very supportive towards the good, helpful for the body to bring down inflammation, optimize hormones, improve brain function. It's, I think, it's a, and this is the thing. Again, I'm not a particularly religious guy. I'm, I'm not religious at all. But my friend, Dr. Serrano, is, and he said to me, he said, Owen, where in nature have you ever seen fat without protein? Or protein without fat, and I would I couldn't answer them because it, it's in everything: eggs, meat, fish, bur. It's, it's all together. So when we're eating foods that are when we eat real food, when we eat real food that ran around the field, that swam in the sky, that swam in the sea, that any real food will have protein or fat in it. Yeah. It's processed food that doesn't have it in it, or pure, very strict vegetarian vegan diets. Great explanation of my short other way around. <laughs> That's what I exactly meant, right? All uh, omega-3 supports all the uh, all essential fatty acids support inflammatory processes. And if we discuss that uh, fat tissue is inflammatory organ, that definitely is going to support um, fat loss and as well as many other uh, benefits. We drive a little bit away from nutrition, um, and I would love to talk about strength training for um, body composition, but also for health and the importance of strength uh, training for strength of female, because I do believe that uh, often females are very weak, and that's what I see, and they come in for uh, fat loss goals, and actually fat loss goal is not that straightforward as we discussed and they often too weak to train for fat loss the way they should be training i don't know that is just my personal clinical observation do you have can you say something about that yes yeah, so, so, so that resolve the results can they expand what i just said yeah, so what happens is, and, and this has been across the world, globally, internationally, when I see people train, they feel they need to be in the fat burning zone to burn fat. That is not true, and that has been debunked multiple times. When you go to the gym and you use heart rate or calorie expenditure as a goal, you've automatically taken it away from building a better body. So if, if we think about cardiovascular exercise, and I'm just for listeners out there, cardiovascular exercise predominantly, not only, but predominantly is lower body, biking, running, spinning classes, not as aerobic classes, it's all lower body orientated. It's lower body orientated because the lower body demands more pressure in the heart, the heart has increased the stroke volume, cardiac output, you know, your breathing rate, your heart rate to facilitate oxygen to do that job. However, Females come into the gym and all my gyms, all my gyms are, are we focus heavily on strength training. People go, oh, do you not do fitness? That word to me is, is mind-numbing. If I put out how I do, I put heart rate monitors on my clients in weight training, and they will hit the same cardiac output as they would if they were outside running. Now, it's not obviously steady state. It will go up and down. They might hit a high number and then back down, but the average is much better. And it's been shown that when people do strength training or circuit training or this tempo or whatever it may be, it, they build better bones, better ligaments, better tendons, better insulin sensitivity. The more hypertrophy type of or strength training movement you do, the better insulin sensitive you are. So for me, I'm building a better body. Do I want my clients to be the born fat? Oh yes, for sure. But if I born, let's say I born 300 or 400 calories in a training session with a client, and I've made them stronger neurologically, better skeletal system, better muscular system, better hormonal system, I'm, I'm not overwhelmed that body. That person's leaving the gym, more insulin sensitive, more metabolically flexible, better able to sleep, so that they can make better food choices, and maybe not eat another, have a calorie deficit of 150 calories, Rather than someone coming to me and you say, no, 500 calories, get on that salt boiler, get on that treadmill, let's get 500 calories. That, that to me, it, 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 it doesn't look at the bigger picture. Building a better female body, more robust, more collagen, more elastin. And I ask females this regularly, and I don't know much about women, but I know that they like the word anti-aging, detoxification, regeneration. <gasps> when you weight train, you improve collagen formation, you slow down aging, you build better bodies. If you run on a treadmill and do all aerobic exercise, you increase oxidative stress, you increase C-reactive protein, you increase these 
rages in the body, glycated end products that can cause all this that de deterioration or rusting to the car. For me, I want my clients fit, strong, flexible, mobile, specifically for the job. They don't have to do the splits, but I want them to be mobile enough to be, to be able to handle all the challenges that they have. And resistance training, strength training, circuit training, body weight movement, strong. I actually watched a video on, on Facebook yesterday with Eddie Hall. He's a real he's a UK strongest man, and more strongest man, I think, at one point. And he was competing as a female. And the female did all the same movements that he did with her body weight and kill them. She absolutely killed them. So I love to see women that are empowered, train strong, do the lift weights. And I, I think for a long time, hopefully it's changed now with CrossFit being more popularized. But strength training is for everybody. Resistance training is for everybody. It's not just for you know, big, hairy, sweaty men. It's for everyone to embrace. But you have to train for that person. Having like women that, that train, they, they think they're going to get mad muscles. It doesn't happen. But they'll get tight, they'll get toned, they get developed, they get symmetry, they get longevity with the hips and the knees and the back. And for me, from a hormonal, metabolic, muscular, skeletal system, it's much more efficient. If you have an hour to train a day, would I pick circuit training with resistance training and intervals over cardio? It's a, it's no, it's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. 100%. And I, I feel. Um many speakers that have joined impact wellness podcast would agree with you and that is the um, message that is getting more and more popular so definitely uh, everyone should do strength training how many times a week she should kind of train to get her benefits and then for maintenance so so getting the benefit initially is more of an investment maintenance level does not necessarily need to be massive so for me the amount of training that i give someone will depend on their body's ability to recover what i, I don't like any more than two lifting sessions in a row so depending on their week it might be four days a week it might be monday tuesday off wednesday Thursday, friday and some movement or activity over the weekend i like at least four sessions a week could you get away with three sessions? Possibly, but four sessions is shown to be substantially more beneficial. Then moving forward, they could get away with three sessions a week. However, you don't know, it's, I say to people, there's days to train and there's days to strain. So initially, you need to push yourself hard, hard, easy, off, hard, easy, off, off, and then go. So four days a week, mi minimum 30 minutes, maximum 60 minutes. If you're in the gym any longer than an hour, you're making friends, you're not training. In, train, out, that's when you do your socializing. So for me, four sessions a week, minimum of 30 minutes, maximum 60 minutes, and with a bit of activity over the weekend, two days in a row, one day off, two days on, and the weekend off, some activity, a hike, a walk, a swim, whatever you want to do with the kids or the family, again, a golf, tennis, whatever it may be, and then back at it again, if you want to get the best investment from it. Beautiful. Um, Owen, oh, just uh, one question is popping here in a short, and I know that this is a big topic. Uh, how would you explain um, the connection between insulin resistance and importance of weight and strength training and body composition training? How this two work together? Because I think women, many women has PCOS, right? And they have having underlining issues uh, with it. And Often they don't do weight training. They often go in for cross trainer or, you know, running. So yeah. what would you advise here? How quickly you would explain them why they should start to do weight training? Okay. So first of all, when you have insulin resistance, um, what happens is insulin is, is important to bring blood sugar levels down again. The minute that you release insulin, the body stops burning fat. So when the body wants to bring blood sugar down, Burning fat will actually bring your blood sugar up, ultimately it's bringing energy back into the body, but insulin is bringing it down. So the seesaw can't be bowed up. So when insulin is up, you're not burning fat. So blood sugar control is essential. Blood sugar control is essential for fat burning. Next of all, when somebody's in the gym, aerobic exercise can be helpful to, to burning fat or it can hinder it. And a lot of people that are insulin, um, resistant it's not helpful so what i would say to those people is don't don't make it too complicated start off doing some interval training so take a 20 minute block and do 20 seconds on 20 seconds off 
20 seconds on, 20 seconds off, until you become more comfortable with that. And over time, you go 20 seconds on, a minute off, and you can change the, 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 the walk to rest ratio. But for those people out there, the more you activate the anaerobic system, the muscular system, you know, not the, the slow twitch fibers which are aerobic, the more you go towards the type 2A and type 2B muscle fibers, they're the ones that store glycogen. So to make it simple for your listeners, our body is primarily very simply, and this is very rudimentary explained, we have fast fibers and slow fibers. Slow fibers are aerobic. They burn oxygen with a bit of fat, and that's it. They go all day. They're the ones that make you walk. You're sitting here right now. These are the ones you're using. These ones here, the fast switch fibers are bigger. They don't require oxygen. That's where they're anaerobic, in the absence of oxygen. But they store more sugar. And the sugar they, they form, they store is called glycogen. Now, the more we deplete these guys of glycogen, the more they become hungry again. You have loads of sugar or glycogen. You deplete it. I'm hungry. I don't know what I'm doing here in my hand. But anyway, the, the fact is, it's more sensitive then to sugar. So when sugar does come, hey guys, I'm hungry, it takes it in again. So it becomes more sensitive to it. But it only gets sensitive if you deplete it. But if you're over here talking to slow twitch fiber, this guy is full, he's not bothered. So stop talking to him, start talking to him, and then the body will be better able to balance sugar when it does come in. Plus, here's a trick. If you don't feed this guy, during exercise, and then you stop training, and all of a sudden this guy is looking around, well hang on, I'm still starving, how am I gonna get fed? Actually, there's a lot of fat tissue down on my bum, there's a little bit on my love handle, I'll get it, I won't go down there, but I'll tell the body to send it up and it can convert it to what's called glucone gluconeogenesis, the formation of glucose from a non-glucose form. So we take the fat, we metabolize it, make it back in and store it as glycogen. So what I'm saying is, when talking to certain fibers, you're training with talk to different fibers, which will have a different after effect. People used to call it EPOC, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. That has been attributed to a certain amount of metabolic rays, but it's also what's called nutrient partitioning, where when these cells are hungry, they'll partition and stabilize and support blood sugar and, and better oxidation in a different manner. So I timing and length and of how, how much time you're giving yourself to achieve your goals. Yeah. Fat loss goals is very important. And if you are insulin resistance, you might need a little bit more probably much more than someone who is very metabolically fit and can oh, yeah. change within those 12 weeks. And um, very, very nice. But uh, so much. Uh, thank you, Owen. Uh, all, is, all is fantastic because you're explaining uh, from clinical perspective as people probably will understand and want to uh, hear. The last question here, and um, we will be closing our amazing conversation. What are your three tips for a busy female who aims to optimize her health? Not the body, but health. Okay, so, so four things for us when it comes to, I'm gonna say male or female health is, we talked with the car, okay? And, and I was speaking to a client on, on Wednesday about aging, and she goes, I wanna age well. So you are not aging. So people think aging happens to them. People think menopause happens to them. People think that getting fat happens to them. You don't. You are aging. You are menopause. So everything that you eat, drink, every time you sleep or you don't sleep, every time you exercise or don't exercise, that's your decision. So you're driving your own car. So if you, the first thing I would say to people is sleep. We need to prioritize sleep. Sleep is so fundamental that it's been shown that if you have bad sleep, it will interfere with every decision making, libido, skin, digestion, detox, brain formation, cognition, mood, emotions, everything. So number one, if sleep is an issue, address it number one. Second of all, you need to prioritize your own health first. Nothing, nothing, nothing comes before it. I say to people all the time about money, investing money into this, investing money into that. The most expensive thing you have in this on this planet is your time. You only need to invest four hours a week, three, four hours a week of exercise. That's easy to do. Put it in your diary like you would a business meeting. There's always a situation where you can get up an hour earlier, half an hour earlier, you can go out for your walk, you can do some training in the back garden or in your apartment. I have one lady in Hong Kong running, running up and down our stairs in our, in our apartment block. 
There's always something you can do. Come up with solutions because in your mind, and people are driven this way, they think of, oh, I can't do that because of the kids. I can't do that because of, no. Stop with the challenges, give me the solutions. One, you can definitely go to bed earlier. Two, you can definitely get up in the morning and get a bit of a sweat going. And three, you only need 45 minutes a day to feed yourself. Three 15 minute meals, that's it. But don't make the decision on the spot. Don't be reactive, be proactive. When you go shopping, open your fridge, open it, go to the shopping center and plan seven breakfasts, seven lunches, seven dinners. Or we're going to do the intermittent fasting. Seven breakfasts, seven snacks, seven lunch, early dinners. But prepare. Prepare for it. So I have this diary here. So my whole week, my whole day, all scheduled. So there's not, if something does come my way and I have to adapt, I'm flexible because I know what the day is going to be. So sleep is number one. Two, put in your exercise like you would in your diary. And three, you need to prepare your food for the optimal week. And I call it the, the ideal week. Plan your life. If you wrote down now the best week of your life right now, what it would look like, I can guarantee next week will be closer to that week than ever before because you know what you want. People know. And people, are, people are much more in control of their, their life than they realize. And they let other people zap their energy. We all have you know, energy vampires. People are bringing us down. Associate yourself with positive people. If there was something wrong with your tooth, something wrong with your knee, you'd go to your physio, you'd go to your dentist, you'd, something wrong with your car, you'd go to your mechanic. Don't go onto Instagram and think you're going to learn all about nutrition and training. Maybe reach to, use that as a resource to reach out to someone and say, you know what, Owen? I like what you said about hormones. Can you recommend someone that can test my hormones? No problem. So you can you can build your life plan. But there's a really good book called Outwitting the Devil. It's quite a funny book too. But and in it, he says people that drift can't give out where they land. If you're just drifting, drifting through day, eating when you can, exercising when you can. I don't know when you're going to get to your destination. The chances of you getting to your destination are slim. But when you proactively, when you structure a plan of nutrition, of training, of sleep, of supplementation, of testing, of, of mindfulness, of maybe it's yoga, maybe it's for you this karma, where I do 10 minutes of meditation every single day. Am I brilliant at meditating? No, but I do it and I feel better after I do it. So it's only 10 minutes. So there's 100% your control of where you are. Make better decisions, live a better life. Be careful what you put in your milk, be careful what you drink, but, but be in the moment. And one of the things I'm going to finish on this, and if there's anything that I've learned over the last few years, this is the biggest thing. We have a desk, we have a, where we are now, our location, and we have our destination, our goal, whether that be to make a million euro or to have kids or to open a business or to lose 10 kilos or, or 20 kilos. It doesn't really matter. Please, please. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Don't when you get there, it may not all be what you want it to be, but just have fun. Have fun and enjoy the process. Don't rush, don't rush your life away. Don't rush your, your kids live away. Can't wait till the kids move out. I can understand that. I can't wait till I open this gym or this business because that's more stress. Enjoy the journey, enjoy your time, work on the process and, and don't uh, don't force it. Uh, Owen, you uh, finished uh, beautifully uh, as you started uh, with asking yourself those coaching questions. Where do I go? What fat loss does mean to me? And unravel further questions because maybe it's not what you're thinking. Um, it's underlying the reasons why you cannot lose, um, lose weight, happiness, joy, family. Maybe they are the reasons. It's not just the as you mentioned, superficial body, and we don't mean superficial, but you want to unravel all of this. Oh, and once again, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Amazing knowledge, uh, clinical application. That's what we wanted. Um, how can we find you? So you can check me out on, on Instagram at, at Own Lacy Education. I also got stuff on YouTube, which is Own Lacy Education as well, or on Facebook, Own Lacy Education. So yeah, our allaceeducation.com have a number of courses there, particularly on female health, weight loss, whatever it is. But if there is questions, do feel free to shoot them on. If, you, if your listeners have questions, we're more than happy to add on videos later down the line. Beautiful. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, everyone. And uh, shall we see and speak uh, next week? Take care.